boy, have we whitewashed this passage over the years. This is a really interesting account that we have in this scripture of maybe the only time that Jesus is a jerk to somebody seeking help from him. Like, it literally points out that he ignores her right off the bat, and then it isn't until his disciples say, send her away, she's bothering us, that he even talks to her, and then he calls her a dog. Yeah, read it again. That's exactly what he did. And then, we're, so we're going to get into it, but this passage is nuts. <laughs> So let's go ahead and set that scene. A woman described by the author of Matthew as a Canaanite woman approaches Jesus desperate for her daughter's healing. Now, for context, Canaanites and Jews did not exactly have the best of relationship. In Mark, this passage, this woman is described as a Syrophoenician woman, which would have actually been a more accurate description of her in Jesus' day. The term Canaanite was already outdated and antiquated by the time Jesus came on the scene. It wasn't something that was used normally. Matthew was written primarily for a Jewish Christian audience, so his use of the term Canaanite is used to make the reader think of the Exodus and the Promised Land. The Canaanites were the ones who inhabited the Promised Land before the Hebrews got there. They were historical enemies. So right from the get-go, we're seeing boundaries being crossed all over this passage. Firstly, the description of this taking place in the region of Tyre and Sidon places it in modern-day Lebanon, which in Jesus' day was inhabited by Gentiles. So the first boundary being crossed is Jesus going outside of the Jewish lands to minister. Second, this woman is a religious outsider to the Jews in more ways than one, and she's seeking help from a Jewish rabbi. And she does something that none of the Pharisees could even do. She flips Jesus' words right on their head, and she outplays him with his own words, which is another thing we never think about in this passage. But think of all the times that Pharisees tried to trip Jesus up, right? They tried to ask him a question, get him to condemn himself. They never could get him to do that. But this woman does this. She uses his own words against him and flips the script and makes him change his mind. The original title of this message was going to be the one where Jesus was a jerk, because he really is not very nice in this, in this whole thing until the end. But in the end, I went with, is it fair? Is it fair? Isn't that a question we've all asked at some point in our lives? We look around and we see suffering, hardships, and think, why them? Why me? Is this fair? And when Jesus initially ignores this woman and then speaks harshly to her, we can't help but feel for her. Is this fair? But then what's striking is her response, as I've already pointed out. Instead of being deterred by Jesus' harshness, she replies with both humility and persistence. Yes, Lord, yet even the dogs eat the crumbs that fall from their master's table. It's like she's saying, I know you might not think I'm worthy, but even a little bit of your mercy can make a world of difference to me. And here I see a little bit of ourselves in her. In our moments of despair, when it feels like life is unfair, don't we too cry out for just a drop of mercy, a hint of grace? Reverend Dr. Derek Weber says of this passage, the runaway train of unfairness that threatens to sweep the Canaanite woman away is not, in the end, more powerful than her strength of will. Is it fair? Of course not. But she and we come to ask not for fairness, but for mercy, not for fairness, but for mercy. How true that is. Life is not always fair, we know this. But in the face of unfairness, we can exhibit resilience and tenacity like the Canaanite woman. We can plead for mercy and understanding. Now, Jesus' response to all of this, because again, he starts off very aloof. He says, woman, great is your faith. Let it be done for you as you wish. It's a beautiful moment, I think. We see Jesus acknowledging her faith and her persistence and expanding his own ministry scope. I think that's important. Here we get the realization that at least for Matthew, Jesus' scope was very specific up to this point. 
he viewed his ministry as only to the Jews. But here we have a Gentile woman who changes all of that, expands it by challenging Jesus. Our Savior's heart is moved by genuine faith, no matter where it comes from. Let me say that one again. Jesus' heart is moved by genuine faith, no matter where it comes from. Have you ever felt like this woman, knocking on doors, seeking help, only to be turned away and treated a little bit unfairly? Well, even in the face of seeming unfairness and rejection, persistent faith can unlock boundless mercy and grace. I think that's what we can take away from this passage. Imagine a scenario where we're faced with what appears to be a closed door or some kind of barrier. Such was the situation for this Canaanite woman. The societal norms, the cultural barriers, and even Jesus' initial response could have easily discouraged her. It would have been easy for her to think, maybe this isn't for me. Maybe I don't belong here. Maybe I should just give up. But she didn't. Her faith was unwavering, and she remained persistent. She didn't demand fairness. She sought mercy. And that's so many of us, I think, should be. We know the world isn't always fair, and we've all experienced moments where it feels like everything is against us. But it's in those moments that our true character shines through. Her story is a beacon for us. It reminds us that no matter how bleak the situation, no matter how many times we're turned away or feel like outsiders, our persistent faith can bring about transformation. It's not about entitlement, but about recognizing the abundant grace and mercy available to all of us when we keep our eyes fixed on the goal. Fixed on the goal. We'll talk about that here in a second. Life is filled with these moments of perceived unfairness. Sometimes they really are unfair. Sometimes we just think they are. But instead of demanding fairness, what if we asked for grace? What if in those tough times, our faith grew even stronger knowing that on the other side of the challenge, there's boundless mercy and love waiting for us? Think about that. How many times have we, like the Canaanite woman, felt on the outskirt, desperate for a touch of hope? But with a heart full of faith, we can all be recipients of God's boundless mercy. How powerful is that? So when faced with trials, let's remember her resilience and persistence. Let's remember that it's not about fairness, but about faith and mercy. And since persistent faith can unlock boundless mercy and grace, even in adversity, we should boldly approach life's challenges with unwavering trust and expectant hearts. I don't think it gets more bold than challenging Jesus and winning, <laughs> really. So if anybody's sitting here in this room or worshiping with us online or comes across this down the road and you think that women are the inferior sex, just remember, only one challenged Jesus and won, and it was a woman. But we should all approach boldly life's challenges. Imagine a life where instead of shrinking back from our challenges, we lean into them with boldness. Sounds invigorating to me. The Canaanite woman story isn't just an ancient tale. It's a call to action for us today. A call to exhibit that same risky faith in the face of life's unfairness. We've all had our share of moments, as I've said before, where the world seems stacked against us. Moments of rejection, hopelessness, desperation. It's natural to feel discouraged in those times. I know I do. But what if in those very moments we chose to respond differently? What if instead of retreating, we pressed forward with an expectant heart filled with faith? Every challenge, every setback, and every closed door is an opportunity in disguise. It's a chance for us to demonstrate our faith and witness the transformative power of grace and mercy in our lives. Our faith, no matter how small or fragile it might seem, has the power to bring about change, not just in our lives, but in the lives of those around us. Problem is, I think, for many of us, while we're called to exhibit persistent faith, the fear of repeated rejection or past hurts can sometimes overshadow our courage to press forward. As an affirmation seeker myself, I have a very real fear of rejection. It's the opposite side of that coin. I seek affirmation and I run from rejection. I avoid it like the plague. As I've said, every one of us has experienced some sort of pain, rejection, or setback. 
It's like an old injury that sometimes still aches when the weather changes. I know I'm not the only one that knows that feeling. These past hurts have a sneaky way of whispering doubts into our ears, especially when we're about to take that leap of faith. Remember the last time you tried, they might say, or are you sure you want to face that kind of rejection again? Maybe I'm the only one that hears these questions. The Canaanite woman had every reason to walk away. Every reason to walk away. After all, the initial response she received from Jesus wasn't the warmest. But she persisted. She persisted. Now, I get it. That's easier said than done. I get it. Our human nature, which usually seeks to protect us from pain, might encourage us to avoid situations where we might face further hurt or rejection. It's a self-preservation instinct, and I just talked about how I struggle with this myself. But here's the beautiful part. Faith isn't about the absence of fear or hurt. It's about pressing forward despite those things. Think about it. If our faith was only active during the sunny days, how deep could it truly be? Let me say that one again. If our faith is only active during the sunny days, the good times, when things are going well, how strong is our faith really? It's the stormy nights amidst the roaring waves that our true faith finds its depth and its strength. Yes, the fear of rejection is real. Yes, the memory of past hurts is valid. But let's remember that every no or closed door brings us closer to an eventual yes or open gateway. Our past does not define our future unless we let it. Our past does not define our future unless we let it. So while we acknowledge the obstacles of past pain, let's also embrace the truth that our faith, our persistence, and the promise of boundless mercy can guide us beyond it. After all, don't the most inspiring stories often begin with challenges? Think about every movie you ever saw that had one of these kinds of endings. They always start with some kind of challenge. The most inspiring stories always start with a challenge. And that's the promise here. Though our past hurts and fears may loom large, God's grace and mercy are infinitely larger, promising healing and hope every step we take. Imagine looking up at the night sky. Among that vast expanse, there are dark patches without any stars, yet it's the luminous stars and the moons and the planets that capture our attention. Much like that night sky, our lives are sprinkled with moments of darkness and of light. The darkness represents our past hurts, fears, and disappointments. They can sometimes feel overwhelming and vast, overshadowing the beauty of the present moment. But just like those glowing celestial bodies that draw our attention, God's grace and mercy stand out, casting light on everything. God's grace isn't just a one-time gift. It's continuous outpouring, a promise that no matter how many times we've stumbled, there's a hand reaching out to lift us up. I hope you are as encouraged and comforted by that thought as I am, that in our most vulnerable moments when the weight of our past threatens to pull us down, there's a grace-filled promise offering healing, hope, and a fresh start. The truth is, every one of us carries those past burdens. But these burdens don't have the final say. Grace does. These burdens don't have the final say. Grace does. Mercy does. It whispers, you are more than your past. You are more than your mistakes. You are cherished. You are loved. So how can we find the strength to trust in God's grace and mercy when our past hurts and fears seem so overwhelming? That's truly at the heart of many of our struggles, isn't it? Our painful past memories tend to play on repeat, sometimes louder than the promises we know to be true. It's like having a radio station playing in the background that only airs your least favorite music. How do we switch the radio station? How do we drown out the songs of hurt and rejection and tune into the melodies of grace and hope? How do we find that strength? How did the Canaanite woman find it? I think it's a question of focus. Where are we placing our attention? On the rearview mirror or on the road ahead? On the shadows behind or the dawn breaking in front of us? For the Canaanite woman, she found that strength to trust and to be persistent by focusing on her why. Why was she there? Why was she there? She was there, okay being belittled, and dismissed by Jesus and his disciples for one reason. She was there for her daughter. She was there for love. 
She loved her daughter so much that she was willing to put up with that rejection. And she wasn't taking no for an answer because love is persistent. So how do we find that strength and persistence? Well, persistence changed Jesus' tune, and I think it can change ours as well. Like the Canaanite woman, we too must approach God with a tenacity rooted in humility while fully recognizing our deepest need for his grace and mercy. When Jesus speaks of children's bread and dogs, it isn't a kind analogy by any stretch. Yet, she doesn't retaliate or walk away in a huff. She responds with profound humility, acknowledging the position he's put her in, but highlighting her faith in the vastness of his mercy. Yes, Lord, she says, but even the dogs eat the crumbs that fall from their master's table. It's a revolutionary thought, isn't it? When faced with adversity, especially from sources we seek help from, our instinct might be to retreat, to protect our wounded pride, but she demonstrates that a humble heart combined with persistence can open doors that seem firmly shut. What she's teaching us is profound. It's not about fairness, it's about mercy. And to truly grasp that mercy, we need to approach God with the same humble persistence that she did. Our past hurts, those overwhelming fears, they're real. But if we continually, humbly, and persistently lay them at Jesus' feet, trusting not in our righteousness, but in his mercy, healing is on the horizon. So the next time we're burdened, by the chains of our past or the shadows of our fears, let's recall this Canaanite woman. Remember her determination, her humility, and her persistent faith. Let her spirit guide us. Let her remind us that with humble persistence in pursuit of God's mercy, no mountain is too high, no valley too deep. She received her miracle that day. And with the same humble persistence, I think so can we. Amen? Amen. Amen. <laughs>